Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I have a couple of fascinating topics today. Of course, I think everything I talk about is fascinating because I'm a science geek, right? Okay, so first topic. According to Tim Spector, who is professor of genetic epidemiology at King's College in London, today's repetitive diets with very few ingredients are resulting in negative changes to the gut microbiome, redu reducing the diversity of the bacteria and potentially contributing to illness. Now, I've said this many times, I'm really excited that everybody's talking about the microbiome these days and its relationship to health. It's very important. It's been a neglected factor for a long time, so this is sort of music to my ears when I heard it. He says that the fact that the junk food's not healthy, not new information we all know, it's filled with saturated fat, all kinds of fat, has no fiber, lots of sugar, etc., etc. But he says another issue, which is even more important, is that 80% of processed food is concentrated in four ingredients, corn, wheat, soy, and meat. And by comparison, our ancestors were regularly eating about 150 different foods every week. Just thinking about that, how many different foods I eat every week, I don't know if I'm up to 150. But anyway, to illustrate the point, Spector's son agreed to eat a junk food diet for 10 days, and stool samples were taken before the start of the 10-day period and then at the end. Well, at the end of the 10-day period, his son reported feeling sick and lethargic. Not surprising, he was eating a junk food diet. But the more important thing was the stool sample showed that he had lost 40% of the bacterial species that were identified when the first sample was taken before the junk food diet. Now, this is only a 10-day period. This is concerning because the gut microbiome is responsible for so many important functions, which include the absorption, facilitating absorption of nutrients from food, serving as a barrier system to keep toxins and bacteria and antigens out of the bloodstream, and also uh, a significant role in immune function for human beings. So Spectre says that negative changes in the gut microbiome in response to eating junk food then result in the person wanting more junk food. Now, we all know about calorie density and we like the taste of sweet things and all that stuff, but I thought this was very interesting. He said the reason is that each species species of microbe prefers specific food sources, of course the ones that help them to survive. Well, pathogenic bacteria like junk food and animal food, which is one of the things that contributes to craving those foods. So the worse you eat, the worse your gut microbiome becomes, the worse the cravings are for the bad foods, and the worse you eat, and so that downward cycle happens. All right, so this is where Spectre completely loses me. Here's what he thinks. He says, first of all, people should eat a varied diet. Okay, on board with that. He says, manufacturers should add um, more diverse ingredients to their foods, like fruit, vegetables, and nuts. And, and this is where we really start to diverge here. I don't think adding fruit, vegetables, and nuts to junk foods is the way out of this. He says that a good example is dairy producers adding prebiotics to their foods, which makes them healthier. My use of the air quotes, not his, of course. He then suggests that personalized probiotics could be added to yogurt products, which could be formulated after testing each person's gut bacteria to determine which microbes were missing. He says that the testing would only cost about 70 euros per person and could be financed through crowdfunding. Well, I think he misses the point. The solution to our health issues, one of which is adverse changes to the gut microbiome in response to bad eating, isn't to see if we can reformulate the junk foods so people can keep eating them, or to formulate personal probiotic compounds to make up missing microbiome or, uh, microbes. It's to use this type of information to impress upon people why they need to change their eating habits and to eat a health-promoting diet like the one we want, um, offer at Wellness Warm Health. So I have a better idea. Give me the 70 euros per person, all right? Send it to Wellness Warm Health. Let us teach people how to eat well. Then they don't need any testing and they don't need any personalized probiotics and their grocery bill goes down and their healthcare bills go down and they live a better life. I'll tell you, for 70 euros per person times 320 million people in the United States, I could make a heck of a difference. So anybody interested in starting that project, um, you can look online for our address and start sending money now. <laughs> All right, but the point is that, that he made here is really important, which is 10 days of eating bad food changes your gut microbiome and your immune function for the worse. That's the point we want to remember, all kidding aside. Okay, 
I uh, want to talk about diet and infertility next. Today about one in six American women struggles with fertility and about 30% of those women have what's called ovulatory infertility. Now anovulation is a disorder in which eggs either don't develop properly or they're not released from the follicles in a uh, timely manner. The causes are a lot. Some of the main ones are hormone imbalances, eating disorders, meaning uh, starvation, um, you know, bulimia, anorexia, that sort of thing, and polycystic ov ovarian syndrome. But the underlying cause of the issues is diet. I mean, that's what leads to hormone imbalances. That's what causes PCOS. More women should be told about the effects of diet on, on, on fertility because, um, I don't know if you've been faced with this, but medical fertility treatments are very expensive. They cause considerable side effects. They often don't work. I know people who've invested literally their life savings in uh, fertility treatments, didn't work. Now they don't have savings. They can't pay for it anymore and, you know, that sort of thing. So let's talk about the effect of diet on fertility. And actually, uh, we could do a lengthy workshop on this, but just three key points that I'll talk about here. Folate levels have an effect on fertility. Women with low folate status and high homocysteine levels have a higher risk of infertility. Now, when you talk about folate, everybody immediately goes to folic acid supplements, which are recommended in lots of ob offices, particularly for pregnant women or women who expect to become pregnant. But um, it's really quite easy to get enough folate from food. It's in green vegetables. Uh, there is no risk of deficiency for women who eat a wellness farm style diet with lots of green vegetables. And by the way, homocysteine, uh, this particular study referred to high homocysteine levels. Homocysteine is a byproduct of methionine me metabolism, and that is an amino acid concentrated in meat and dairy products. So one way to address this issue, increase green vegetable eating, decrease animal food consumption, homocysteine levels go down, folate status goes up. Now, homocysteine is not the only issue associated with eating animal foods and fertility. Women who eat more animal protein and less plant protein have a higher risk of ovulatory infertility than women who eat more beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds, so better to get the protein from plants. Dairy interferes with fertility in many, many ways, one of which is that all dairy foods and products contain estrogens and estrogen metabolites. So to the extent that this is all related to hormone status, that's not so good. But data from the Nurses Health Study shows that women who ate two or more servings of low-fat dairy a day had an 85% increased risk of ovulatory infertility compared with women who ate low-fat dairy once a week indicating that the protein is the uh, issue. And of course, that's one of the major problems that we've had with dairy is the assumption that as long as it's low fat, it's better. The assumption was saturated fat was the problem with dairy, and that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Lots of other problems with dairy. Last but not least, weight status has been associated with infertility. Overweight women much more likely to suffer from infertility than normal weight women. And one of the reasons is that adipose cells pump out estrogen um, estro or, uh, hormones that are converted to estrogen in the bloodstream by aromatase. Um, and so that contributes to hormone imbalances which then lead to infertility. Plant-based diet, very effective for weight loss um, and fat loss since portion control and calorie counting not required by most people. So infertility is just one more example of the expensive, inconvenient, and devastating effects of the standard American diet. Easily prevented, easily resolved, and, um, and particularly when targeted herbals are used and that sort of thing, fertility issues can be resolved with, with diet. Um, I have to say, over the years, uh, we've never advertised that eating better changes fertility status, but over the years, we have had quite a few members who have delivered healthy full-term infants after long periods of infertility or serial miscarriages when they change their diet. And I don't think anything magical is going on here. Healthier women find it easier to get pregnant and deliver healthy babies. So um, it just makes common sense. All right, that's all for today. It's all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you again next week with more news.